Thanks for coming this morning. I want to talk to you about a discovery that my team made in December of 2019. Uh, I'm an archaeologist. I have a PhD in ancient Near Eastern archaeology, also have a doctoral degree in theology, and so I bring these two to bear, two disciplines to bear, with the idea of how they can dialogue with one another to help us understand both in a better way. Um, I have the, the opportunity of excavating several biblical sites, uh, one in Jordan and three in Israel. I have one more sort of on my horizon before my career closes out, and I want to focus in this morning on Mount Ebal and the discovery that we made there in December of 2019. This came about through my interest in a couple of new technologies. So one of these is called wet sifting. Archaeology on one hand is very high tech, on the other hand it's very low tech. We still need physical human beings in archaeological squares under supervision, moving dirt and making decisions based upon that. Now, contrary to popular opinion, I've never had a Bible in one hand and a trowel in the other. Uh, well, I actually did a video a couple of years ago just to mess with people. So I had a, had a trowel and I'd move some dirt and then I'd read a verse and move some more dirt. And, you know, sometimes that's, that's what they think. I was accused of that in the media this week, you know, just trying to prove, uh, trying to prove the Bible. As an evangelical Christian, it seems in some people's minds, I don't have the capacity to be unbiased. But, the, of course, the agnostic or the atheist can be completely unbiased, okay, and, and dispassionate in the view of many. So I've pushed back against that my entire career, and I've said, wait a minute, we use the Egyptian literature, we use the Mesopotamian literature, don't tell me we can't use the biblical literature when we're excavating biblical sites, many of which are only mentioned in the Bible. It would be a crime if we, if we did not. And uh, I became aware of wet sifting about 15 years ago when I was a supervisor on the Temple Mount Sifting Project where we were going through the debris, about 40 tons of debris from the destruction of the southwest corner of the Temple Mount. I'm sorry, southeast corner of the Temple Mount. And I saw that what had been missed by dry sifting, we normally sieve material and then we dump that material and we create big dump piles. We went back and we washed it. We created sort of a primitive at first system. And we, when we washed it, we found that we were throwing away more than we were finding. So I made up my mind that when I was in a position one day to do this at my own dig, where we could do it in situ in the field, because the greatest value of the material is when we have it in context, is that I was going to develop a system to do that. So what I wanted to do <clears throat> was to take what James Starkey had originally done at Lachish in the 1920s, and Starkey was just a brilliant archaeologist. Sadly, he was murdered in the Damascus Gate, and uh, this brought an end to the, the Lachish dig. His students and his protégés sort of forgot about this, or they didn't continue the practice, I think because it's expensive and it's time-consuming. And so, you know, people are always looking for a shortcut, but my response is, what's the rush? Uh, as an archaeologist, I get one bite at the apple. I cannot replicate the experience because it's a destructive process. As an archaeologist, I am destroying the evidence and the process of excavation and making it inaccessible to other people. No one can go back and repeat this experiment. And so, there's a great burden on me and on other archaeologists to do it right the first time. So with Starkey's experience, with Gabi Barkai's reintroduction of this 15 years ago, 16 years ago, um, I then became the first to use this in the field. So we have a huge state-of-the-art washing system with our own water tower, and we, we wash everything that we excavate. And I, I did a test case and I went back to the old dump piles at Shiloh from the 1980s and 1920s. For every one scarab that they had published, I found four in the dump pile. For every one bula that they published, I found four in the dump pile. I found hundreds of coins, stone vessels, just incredible seals, all these things were in the dump pile. Now, that means we've been throwing away about 75% of the evidence in the past. Now, just let that sink in for a minute. When someone says, well, we excavated Megiddo or Hatsor or wherever, and we didn't find evidence of something, well, I guess not. When we're throwing away 75% of the, the evidence as it relates to the small finds or the glyptic remains. So what I wanted to do was to take a second site 
where there was an old dump pile, process that, and then I was going to publish the results. Sort of a boring methodological paper to my colleagues saying, you know, we can't keep doing this the way we've been doing it because, you know, there, there's a better way. Aren't we funny as human beings? We cry out for change and then we resist it with all our might. And here we've got an opportunity, demonstrably better way to do this, but yet we have resistance in many quarters to this. So I went to Mount Ebal, which is on one side of Nablus, ancient Shechem. And so you have Mount Gerizim on one side, Mount Ebal on the other, as I'll show you in a minute. And we went through a dump pile from the 1980s there. And this is where we recovered via wet sifting the artifact that I'm going to talk to you about today. So the name of my talk is a seminal inscription for Bounty Ball, Cursed by the God Yahweh. Real encouraging title, isn't it? In Deuteronomy 11:29, Moses instructed the Israelites to pronounce blessings from Mount Gerizim and curses from Mount Ebal, Deuteronomy 27, 12, and 13 indicates that they obeyed his instructions. They didn't always do that, but in this case they did. Now this text is written from a place called Shittim, Joshua 2.1, Joshua 3.1, Numbers 25.1. This is where the Israelites spent the last six to nine months of the 40 years camped in the plains of Moab, and, and this is where, in fact, Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy, and from there he ascended Mount Nebo, according to the, to the biblical text, and died. Joshua assumed leadership and then led the Israelites across into Canaan. In Deuteronomy 27, 4 through 7, also written as Shittim, we read, When you cross the Jordan, erect these stones on Mount Ebal, as I command you today, and coat them with plaster. Build there an altar of stones to the Lord your God. Do not use any iron tool on them. Build the altar of the Lord your God with field stones and offer burnt offerings to Him on it. Sacrifice fellowship offerings there, eating them and rejoicing. Now notice that Moses doesn't explain to them why Mount Gerizim and why Mount Ebal. They did not need explanation. They already knew that that's where the Abrahamic covenant was cut at Elon More, from Mount, from Nablus, the tomb, tomb of Joseph, for example, at, at Shechem, you can throw a stone to, to Elon More. This is where Abram cut covenant with God. So the Israelites are going to go back there when you gain a foothold in the land. In other words, Jericho and then I, a site my team spent 21 years excavating. Then you're going to go to Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal and renew this covenant there. And then we read in Joshua 8.30, Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal, an altar to the Lord. Interesting that he did not build it on Mount Gerizim, the mountain of the blessings, because six tribes pronounced blessings from Mount Gerizim, six tribes pronounced the curses of the covenant from Mount Ebal, but the altar is built on Mount Ebal. You'll build it there to the God of Israel as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded. He built it according to what is written in the book of the law, Deuteronomy, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. So pretty straightforward what the biblical text says. We have no other text that tells us anything about what's taking place at this time. Enter Adam Zertal. Adam Zertal was a war hero. He was injured in the Israeli War for Independence. He walked on crutches for most of his career, so amazing what he accomplished. He was reared in a kibbutz in Israel. Some of you are quite familiar with Israel, and you know that the whole kibbutzim movement in Israel is a very secular movement. These were Eastern European Jews who had migrated to Israel, and they brought their communism and socialism with them. So they did not read the Bible. They didn't believe in God. They were totally secular. Adam Zertal was raised in that environment. He went on and earned a PhD in archaeology, and after the war became a professor at the University of Haifa, and he was placed in charge of the Manasseh Hill Country Survey. Manasseh, if you'll remember, had the largest of all the tribal allotments. So it's a very large allotment in maybe the region that we would think of as, as Samaria. Now, Zertal has never read the Bible at this point, but he's in charge of surveying the biblical sites in Manasseh, sort of, sort of a curiosity. And he came to this site at what we call El Bernat A, 
and he came across a massive heap of stones, maybe similar to this entire space that we're in today. And it seemed to him that it was an intentionally buried site. He decided to excavate the site. And from 1982 to 1989, he excavated a large rectangular altar, nine meters by seven meters with a ramp to the west. Underneath that altar, what he later came to believe was an altar because he didn't even think about that until several years of excavation because he hadn't read the biblical text, but someone showed him what the Bible said and lo and behold, Adam Zertal became a believer from what he saw. Now this became a crisis in academia. We can't just have professors at Israeli universities walking around talking about God and Bible, but that's what Adam did. And so it became quite, quite, the, quite the problem or the conundrum in higher education. Now, to make matters worse for the skeptic, underneath that rectangular altar, which he dated to about uh, 1220, the construction of it to about 1225, was an earlier round altar at the perfect geometric center. Round altar on top of which is a rectangular altar preserving and venerating. In archaeology, we call this a timenos, or a sacred precinct, a sacred location. So clearly it is an intentional thing. Zertal's dates for the, the site in its entirety are about 1250 to 1150 BC, or what we would call Late Bronze Age II and Iron Age I. Now I have reason to believe, and as I pub have published academically, that those dates should actually be pushed back uh, a little bit, and I'll show you, show you why. And uh, there's, there's, everybody's always trying to, to, to jockey around the dates, and, and I'll, I'll show you my reasons why I think that, that it dates a little bit earlier than this. Zertal died about seven years ago before doing final publication. Now, he put it off for many, many years, and we archaeologists are not... Uh, we don't shine in this area. It's more fun to excavate than it is to publish. So the hard work comes in the publication. I put a, an extremely high priority on publication in my work and with my team. I just published Kirby Del Makata, our previous excavation. I'm now excavating at Shiloh and we've already published the work at Mount Eval. Unfortunately, this is a problem because when a site is excavated, there is an institutional memory, notes are taken, research is done. With time, things get lost, people start dying, and it becomes more and more difficult. Adam did do a good preliminary report, but unfortunately, we did not have final publication. So for me, with a research focus in the period of the conquest, Israel's conquest or entry into the land, then this was a, a, another reason why I was very interested in this site. So you've got stratum one on top, stratum two on the bottom. Now this is what the site looks like. It is a foot-shaped enclosure, the size of about four football fields, about 410 meters across. Inside of that foot-shaped enclosure is a smaller foot-shaped enclosure that is about 100 meters. So a foot-shaped enclosure inside a foot-shaped enclosure. Zertal actually found six of these going up the Jordan Valley, beginning down, down at the, the, the bottom near the crossing point near Jericho, and then coming up the Jordan Valley, the final one being here at Mount Ebal. Perhaps there were originally 12 of these and maybe they were campsites, you know, the tribes were camping in, in different locations, but six have survived uh, and, and this is what he found at El Bernat. Inside the smaller foot-shaped enclosure is where the altar was and when he excavated this from 82 to 89, he dumped, remember you excavate, then you check by dry sifting. They had no concept of wet sifting, nor would they have been able to, there's no water on site, or at least they would have had to have brought in water. But they dumped into an east dump, a west dump, and a center dump, and then fortunately in his notes, he kept charge of what material went into which dump. So what we did in December of 2019, we had just like this unusually nice December weather we're having here in Texas, uh, we had some unusually nice December weather in Israel and we were able to do this, this project and we relocated material from the east dump and the west dump, keeping track of which came from which dump, to a nearby site where we could then wet sift that matrix and what we found in it was pretty astounding. 
Now, just to bring you up to speed on the most complex political situation in the world. Now, I know the next year in America, you're going to have some political tensions that everybody's going to have to navigate, but welcome to my world, the West Bank of Israel, okay? So this is where, where I work in Judea, Samaria. Some people call it, depending on your politics, uh, Area C, Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, you know, the nomenclature changes depending on the crowd. But this is what it looks like. So this was created in 1993 with the Oslo Accords. So when Jordan, of course, lost control of this area in 1967, when they attacked Israel in the Six Day War, then they lost control of the biblical heartland, Judea, Samaria. And there was jockeying over this area until the Oslo Accords in 1993 created what we call areas A, B, and C. So area C is under complete Israeli control, uh, military and civil. So all of the gray area in here, that's area C. Area A is under complete Palestinian control. So that would be Jericho, Nablus, places like this. So that's civil and military. Um, now that's not to say that Israel can't enter into those areas if there is a, a problem. And then area B, is the divided territory that's Israeli military control and Palestinian civil control. Guess where Mount Ebal is? Area B. <laughs> so the disputed territory within the disputed territories. So, you know, uh, layers and layers of complexity here. When, when we deal with international law and UN law, you know, it's, it's a very complex situation. Is the site grandfathered in under previous legislative uh, decree since the excavations happened in the 1980s prior to 1993 and who's actually in charge and these are things that as Americans maybe many times we don't even think about but that's the complexity of what you have in the so-called West Bank today. Now I want to introduce you to Larry Stager. He was the dean at Harvard for many many years, the docent of uh, archaeologist, uh, a senior leader in the field for sure. And when Zertal announced that he had found an altar on Mount Ebal, then you wouldn't believe the pushback that he got about this idea. And so here's Larry is typical of what people said at the time. If there's an altar on Mount Ebal, as Zertal claims, we, biblical scholars and archaeologists, should all go back to kindergarten. Oh, you know, so of course, Larry's very clever. This is his way of saying there's no way that this is an altar on Mount Ebal. Funny that now most archaeologists, secular and religious, accept that that is an altar on Mount Ebal. And so you see what I'm saying about we being funny creatures? We cry out for change and then we resist it with all our might. And new ideas many times have pushback before they, they become accepted. Or if I could put it this way, we cling to the status quo even when the quo is no longer the status. <laughs> geometry. When we find symmetry, when we, when we find geometry in the ancient world, it is intentional. Things don't just line up perfectly accidentally. And so having this round altar at the perfect geometric center of the later rectangular altar is a clear indication that it was to protect it and to venerate it. In other words, believers in the period of, to use biblical nomenclature, the period of the Judges or Iron Age I, came along and they saw, here's this altar where this incredible thing happened and it's getting, time is passing and it's you know, showing its, its age. We're going to build around it to venerate it and protect it. The Dome of the Rock, why is it that that rock matters? Why is it that everyone wants that real estate? There's other real estate you could build on. It's because if you believe the biblical text, Abram bound his son Isaac on that rock. And that's why everyone wants that spot. It's a timonos. It has a, it has a history. Now, stratum one and stratum two are kind of interesting. I'm a ceramicist. That means I'm an expert in ancient pottery, or as my wife would say, boring. <laughs> like, who, who cares about ancient pottery and broken dishes? Quite frankly, I don't even care about modern 
dishes, okay? I don't even care about yard work, you know, modern yard work. In my, I don't even work in my own yard here because I found the, find this dirt to be very boring, whereas I find the, the dirt over there to be very, very interesting. And I find the dishes over there to be very interesting too. Pottery is our primary means of dating an archeological site still to this day. So the deeper we go in a site, the older the material becomes. And so our job then is to figure out our stratification or our levels. How do we know that we're moving from one level to another and how do we date those levels? Now, we do have scientific testing that we can do at times. Uh, yesterday, I got 10 radiocarbon dates back. That, you know, we're studying from, from our dig at Shiloh. So sometimes we have metrics like that. Luminescence testing on soil is a new thing that we're doing. So we, we take anything we can get, glyptic finds, you know, like scarabs or something like that. But for the most part, we're dating using pottery. So this is critically important. And if this matters to you, you can, as we say in Texas, sit forward in the saddle uh, as we look at this slide. There are seven pieces here that you're looking at, which date, and, and incidentally, only about 3% of the pottery dates to the late Bronze Age. About 97% is iron one. And this is what we would expect. The Bible doesn't indicate that the, the site was used and continued to use as a timonos. It appears to have been used, left, and then in the period of the judges, reoccupied at that site and becomes a thing again. So again, it's only a small percent of the pottery that is from the late Bronze Age. The question is, is it from the end of the late Bronze Age or the beginning of the late Bronze Age? And these forms that, that you, you see on the screen here indicate that these particular vessels did not exist at the end of the late Bronze Age, in particular the ones that I have highlighted. In other words, they're in use and they've gone out of use by that time. Now, interestingly, there were a series of three articles that were published this last week, how fortuitous for the timing of our gathering here in what's called the Israel Exploration Journal, by scholars challenging our finding, because we published this in, in Heritage Science about six, seven, eight, nine months ago. And, um, in, in this, I present these, these ceramic forms and why this is an indicator for dating for us, because they no longer exist at this time. Other archaeologists would know this thing, and it's easily checkable. I put references and parallels and, and things like that. So in one response from one archaeologist, um, he said, well, it's not... Uh, just not possible. These, 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 these forms do continue on. Didn't address the parallels, didn't address the drawings, just said it's not possible. In other words, it is so because I say it is so, or it is not so because I say it is not so. Listen, I've never wanted favorable treatment because I'm a believer. All I've ever wanted was a level playing field, okay? And this same scholar, by the way, is the editor of the same journal where he published his response. Now, it seems a little fishy that editors are editing their own peer-reviewed work. Some of you are scholars in other fields, and you know that's not acceptable. Now, we also have scarabs, or Zertal found scarabs from Mount Ebal. This is really interesting. A scarab is, the Latin word scarabus means beetle. The Egyptians believed that the dung beetle pushed the sun across the sky each day. Now, of course, this is ridiculous. We all know that Apollo hitches up his four horsemen every morning and pulls the sun across the sky. Lots of scarabs exist in, uh, from Egypt and in Canaan, and Canaan was part of Egypt in the late Bronze Age. There was a city-state system. Each pharaoh created his own iconography, so there is a typology by which we can date these scarabs, or at least most of them. For example, on the left, you can see in the cartouche on the left-hand side, the actual name of Tutmosis III. I mean, so this is the most powerful of all the pharaohs of all time. Uh, so he conquers Canaan in about 1479. He left victory stellas all over the place. Very, very famous pharaoh. The scarab on the right does not have a cartouche. And uh, Baruch Brandel dated it at the time to Ramesses II. Now, we have divergent views on when the Exodus happened. I believe that it happened, the biblical date is around 1400 B.C., I wrote a chapter in Zondervan's new book on this called Five Views on the Exodus. So it's a really a great academic way to do it. You know, five scholars write their views, they critique each other's views, so it's really a great way to learn. They asked me to write chapter one. I said, yes, 
because most people only read the first chapter in a book. So I thought, this is great. And so you can read about all, all the reasons why I think this matters. The only reason I bring that up now is to say that the scarab on the left seems to support the early view. The scarab on the right seems to support the later view. However, as I presented in my Heritage Science article, Israel's leading scarab expert, Dafti Bentor, who's in charge of the Egyptian collection at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, is now on record, and I published it, as saying that is not Ramesses II, that is also Tutmose III. So the response from the scholars in the opposition article was that um, it can't possibly be because Baruch Brandel already published it back in the, you know, 25 years ago or whatever, did not even address the fact that the, without dispute, the number one expert in the field agrees with what I'm saying. They just said it can't be so because we say it is not so. Welcome to my world. Zertal also found gold earrings at the site. I cannot tell you how rare gold is cannot properly express to you how rare gold is in an archaeological site. Most archaeologists work their whole career and never find any gold. People don't just lose gold. If you come across it, it is intentional. It is an offering. And indeed, that's what's found here. Zerta believed that these were stylized, Egyptian stylized earrings. Now here's what the site looks like as you're approaching. Very few people ever, ever get to go there because it's problematic. Today, to get there, you're supposed to have a bulletproof uh, bus and military escort and all of this, this stuff to get there. Um, it's really quite beautiful because it is unencumbered by modernity. So when you're dealing with a place like Jerusalem, you have urban sprawl. Now, I could take you in Jerusalem and show you under that building, the third wall is running underneath here, and here's, a, here's this tomb, and here's this feature. So it's all there, but it's a problem to conceptualize it for the, for the average person. Whereas at a site like this, it's just the same way that it was in biblical times. Here's my team as we're first arriving. You can see those beautiful mountains off in the distance. So it really is quite, quite breathtaking. This is a look down upon that rectangular altar. And again, at the perfect geometric center, in other words, right here, is where that round altar was found uh, underneath it. This is all filled with ash. Um, you, you, the, the material in the east dump pile is very gray and ashy. The material in the west dump pile, which is from, from another structure, is very, very different. Um, Let's, let's get an idea of the site. You can see as we move around here, you're looking here toward the west. You're inside the foot-shaped enclosure, which is inside the other foot-shaped enclosure. And as you swing around, you'll see the east. This is the uh, east dump pile right over here where we, where we found the object that we're going to talk about. But yeah, you can see the fortification wall. This has been in the news the last couple of years because the local Palestinians have destroyed some of that wall in the last couple of years, grinding it up to make gravel for a road. And then just uh, maybe a month or so ago, there was a road that was being built to the, to the site. And so now the military is camped out there to try to protect it. My hope is that this would become a heritage site and that it would be protected. Um, all of the an antiquities are in grave danger in this, this area, what we, whether you want to call it A, B, or C, uh, they, they really are in grave danger. Uh, Shiloh, where I'm now the director of excavations, is an exception to that because we have a massive security fence around it and I have 4,500 people who live there who guard it for me. So that, that's the, the rare exception. But this really is in danger and hopefully it will be annexed from Area B and Area C after the current war ends and perhaps we'll actually be able to do excavation uh, there and find some more concrete answers. Now I mentioned my, my chapter in Five Views on the Exodus, but here's an excerpt of what I wrote back in 2021. I see it, that is the round altar, as more than one century older than Zertal saw it. And I believe that his stratum two should be subdivided and that the material just above bedrock in pit 250, surface 61, and installation 94, which is the round altar, derives from the 
end of the Late Bronze Age 1B, or around 1400 BC, I propose that these loci and installations pertain to a different century. I would call this stratum 2B. So we took the material from Mount Ebal, from these dump piles. And of course, all this is expensive and complex, as you might imagine. Nothing is ever easy in the Middle East. And so the, this material is relocated, and the stone that is mixed in with it, some of it we take and we rebuild here a two-by-two two altar from that stone from Mount Ebal. So uh, you can get a really good idea of the size of what this altar would have been that Joshua 8 uh, talks about. And you can see I've got my UT jacket on, so I'm not just, not just playing to the crowd here today, okay? This was on the cover of one magazine recently, um, covering the Mount Ebal tablet. And you can conceptualize the size. And now I'm going to, for the next 90 sentence, seconds, drop you down into this archaeological project to give you an idea of just what it was like. The volume's a little weak at the beginning, but it'll get stronger as the, as the video plays. Okay, welcome to the MEDS project, the Mount Ebal Dump Salvage. This is day two. And you can see that we are up and running now. We've got all of our uh, sifted material that is now soaking so that then can be dry sifted. This is Emmeline who's working with this. And there's Abigail was just helping me sort yesterday's pottery. And Gary is off to go get something important. And you can see here our provisional uh, wet sifting station we were using while we were building our new one that's about to be up and running. Here's the sacred soil that we've already sifted through and we're doing flotation on some of this also so that we can extract seeds. And here is our new wet sifter that we're building provisionally for this area. And here's Steve who masterminded the, the project. And looky here, we're gonna be moving up in the world. Suzanne and Greg, say hi to the folks back hey. home. We're sending us money. There we go. And here's Melody, who's dry sifting away. Send money, send say, money. Say hi to yeah, That's right, amen. Keep those checks coming. This is Jacob from Springtown. And Jacob's uh, working away here. When he's not eating cheese, he's working. And here's Terry. He got on my bad side, so he has to scrape the concrete. And uh, <laughs> here's Brent working away, cleaning out the, the rock that's mixed in with the soil so that it'll be easier for us to dry sift and then to wet sift. And then here's Ellen who's going fast at it. And these, these last two are Texans. And uh, you can see off in the distance, Mount Ibal. And then just that way would be ancient Samaria. And then just this way would be Mount Gerizim. And we've got a beautiful day. We're in short sleeves working our way. And uh, just sorted our first day's uh, pottery and finds. Big stuff, so you guys keep praying for us. Appreciate your support. So a building had burned down at this community called Chave Chabron, and so all we had to do was clear away the debris from where the building had burned down, and the slab then was a perfect place for us to do this project. We stayed in the cabins right next to it, so literally we could you know, work all day if we, if we wanted to. So that, that's where the, the project took place. Here I am um, at the altar itself. Now, my left foot and my left hand are touching the top of the round altar. So that will give you an idea of what's there. We did not excavate, okay, uh, anything inside the altar. All we did was to take the material from the dump piles and then we checked that material. But that gives you an idea of how nice the weather was also. Now, you may have picked up on the name of the project was MEDS, Mount Ebal Dump Salvage, or some people would say we should be on MEDS for having done this. You can see here the pottery. Pottery is so critical to an archaeological dig. There's my laptop. You can see there I'm having a cup of coffee. I mean, in the civilized world, one should not be expected to analyze pottery without coffee, okay? So, uh, again, very high-tech on one hand, very low-tech on the other hand. This is very typical Iron Age I uh, pottery. Now, Zertal identified a type of pottery that he called Ainun pottery. Now, Ainun pottery is very interesting because it's Bronze Age in form, but it's Iron Age in wear. Now, we scratch our head on that because, you know, ideally the wear matches the form and so forth. It's almost like reading a defense. So a quarterback only has two, I'm going to the Cowboys game in Dallas uh, tomorrow night, so pray for me. Um, yeah. 
just imagine you, your, your quarterback has a couple of seconds to make a read. If the defensive back steps back, he does this. If he steps forward, he does that. So he has to read through this really quickly. Of course, big guys are trying to kill him in the process. When we're reading pottery, it's the same way. We have multiple indicators. Do, does the rim evert? Does it invert? Does the wear have organic inclusions in it? What does the base look like? And so there's, there's a hundred different little things that, that we would have to read. In this case, you have a, a type of pottery that now Abigail, who is my, my assistant director, she's now doing her PhD in Israel at Ariel University um, on this very topic, the transition between the Bronze Age and, and the Iron Age. And she started with me as a volunteer when she was like 20, 20 years old, and now soon she'll be running the world, I think. Um, but these are the critical topics that we continue to research. What do we do with this pottery? Can we date it? Does it belong in the Bronze Age? Does it belong in the Iron Age? Uh, Zertal also found these Manasseh bowls, which are typical of the transition between the Late Bronze Age and the Iron Age that are important. Now, this is the modern city of Nablus. Nablus gets its name from Neapolis. This city was founded in AD 72 in the first century. This is where Joseph is buried. This is ancient Shechem. Uh, this is where Jesus had his encounter with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And you can go to that well uh, today. That's Mount Gerizim on the left, Mount Ebal on the right. The covenant renewal ceremony took place here with the Ark of the Covenant and the Levites in the middle. Now here I am, and that's Abigail to the, the left there with the greenish cap. And we were actually continuing to survey, because Zertal didn't uh, finish his work. Shai Bar, a professor from the University of Haifa, is now completing that. So we were actually are, are part of that survey team that is continuing Mount Kabir, which is one mountain that Zertal missed in his, in his survey, checking every archaeological feature that is there and documenting it. You can again tell I'm a native Texan with my Whataburger shirt. <laughs> this is ancient Shechem, a very prominent biblical site, also mentioned in the Amarna letters and other extra biblical sources. That man at the base of that wall is six foot tall. That's what walls look like, city walls look like in the Bronze Age. On top of that, there was a mud brick superstructure that's going up probably another 30 or 40 feet. That's what all cities looked like when the Israelites came into the land. They were walled and the stones are massive. They call them cyclopean type stones. Demographically, they were barely holding on. Um, there was a drought. You'd had a major population decline. So they had big cities on the outside, but on the inside, they're barely hanging on. Here you can see the west gate at Shechem, again, to get an idea of the size. Here's a temple mentioned in the Bible called the Temple of Baal Berith. And um, per perhaps right around here is where the Ark of the Covenant would have been with the Levites, with the pronunciation of the blessings and the curses. Now these next several slides I'm going to go through real fast to give you a look at the construction of the rectangular altar to cover the round altar. My architect, Lane Rittmeyer, you may know the name, he's the world's leading expert on the Temple Mount, uh, drew these at the time for Zertal, so I think this will help you uh, see it. So as we run through these, you kind of get the idea. There's the round altar in the middle, how it's being filled, the retaining walls, and then what the site looks like ultimately. Here you can see with a cutaway of where the round altar is. So no, long, no one has access to the round altar after this point. Now it's been covered up around 1225. And, and so it's only the, the larger altar that's being used. And that entire area is filled with bone and ash. When we wet sift, we then float the soil. That means the seeds, will, we do heavy fraction. So the seeds will then float to the top. So then we test the seeds. The bones are studied then by a zoo archaeologist. The seeds are studied by a botanist. So everything that we have, we, we study because we want to understand to the best of our ability what was going on in biblical times. This is my photographer, Michael Ludini. He was 88 at this point. And um, Michael said this was the highlight of his career, finally getting to Mount Ebal. Um, Michael, in his curmudgeon old voice said to me, 
Um, when I first came to Israel, the Dead Sea was only sick. <laughs> Here's part of my team when we're first arriving for the project. You can see, obviously, that it's, it's Christmas time. This is at the Ritz Hotel uh, right by the Albright Institute. And you can see, of course, that we all have our Quaker Oats with us. An army runs on its tummy, and my army runs on Quaker Oats. And I was also trying to get money from the Quaker Oats Foundation at the time, so I sent them this picture. I'm still waiting on the check. <laughs> this is the object that has uh, created so much controversy. Remember when Abram Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, Lincoln being six foot five and Harriet Beecher Stowe being four foot ten, he condescended to her and shook her hand and said, so you're the little lady who started this great big war. Of course, talking about her novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. But uh, this, this tablet is quite small. You're talking about a business card folded in half uh, is the size of this. Uh, as soon as I saw it, it was in the tray of our most experienced volunteer, Frankie Snyder, who'd worked for 12 years or more on the Temple Mount Sifting Project. And fortunately, this was in Frankie's tray. We missed it in dry sifting. It's just a little thing covered in dirt. You see lots of little things covered in dirt. Zertal's team missed it in dry sifting. My team, who is very good, missed it in dry sifting. It was only when we took it through this next level of protocols that we recovered the tablet. Frankie said, Scott, you better come see this. Now, usually that's really good or really bad. And when I went over, I looked at it, I said, you've got to be kidding me. Because she knew what it was, and I knew what it was. I called Abigail over. We all knew what it was. I mean, this is a known thing. It's called a defixio, or a curse tablet. Now, you mean to tell me we have a curse tablet on the mountain of the curse? From the east altar, because that's the dump that it came from, was the east, where Zertal said the material from the, that it came. I'm just sort of trying to run this through my head, and I remember telling them on the spot, now, don't get your hopes up. I mean, this is really, really cool, but it could be from a later time period because I'm not aware of these defixiones in earlier periods like this. Maybe someone from a later period thought it was Joshua's altar and left it here. But while I'm telling them that, I'm thinking, but wait a minute, we don't have any pottery. We don't have anything from that later period, so how could that happen? And the, the project ended, we put this in storage along with everything else, assuming that I would be back a few months later and then we would continue our research. And then in March 2020, I was at an archeological conference in Southern Mexico. I'm fluent in Spanish, so I'm speaking at this Mexican university about archeological matters. And in March 2020, the world turned upside down. And uh, lo and behold, I could not get back into Israel. And so I, was not able to continue the project for, for, for a bit. I was contacted by a, a Christian news agency wanting to know if I would go with them to Israel as the spokesperson for this documentary that they wanted to do. I said, oh, I'd be happy to, but I'm locked out of the country. I can't get in. They said, don't worry, we'll get you journalist credentials. I said, really? A few days later, a FedEx package arrived. I said to my wife, look, Janet, I'm a journalist. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm going to have to learn how to lie. I mean, <laughs> caught right on. That was a joke, okay. <laughs> so I went with them and did what they wanted me to do, but this enabled me to get the tablet, to get an export permit from the Antiquities Authority, and get this to a lab in Prague where I had found a team with expertise in tomographic scanning actually scanning through lead. Now, I didn't even know you could do that. I was under the impression that when I went to the dentist and they put this lead thing on me, that you couldn't penetrate through that. So apparently that does no good because you can penetrate through lead. And they had, they had published uh, inscriptions that they had penetrated through lead. So they got the results and they began to send back the tomographic scans. I formed a, an international team to study this with three epigraphers on it and they began to see on the inside ancient letters. And the letters were older than the early Roman period. In fact, they dated all the way back to the Bronze Age, what we would call a proto-alphabetic script. 
So this is, we begin to see these types of scans. Now there's slice after slice after slice, and it takes a long time to learn how to see things tomographically. Some scholars who have now reacted just this last, last week to this, they're looking at 2D photos, which are of course going to be more difficult. It took us a long time to accustomize our, our eyes, to acclimate our eyes to, to be able to see this on these tomographic scan, uh, uh, scans. Now there are cracks in here, we are not publishing cracks as letters, okay? We're taking very definite indentations, and we begin to see clearly some man-made things on the inside of this and to try to make sense of those. Ultimately, <laughs> a hodgepodge. This is what we believe that it says, something similar to this, um, if, if I'm understanding this correctly. Now, I'm not insisting on my reading of this. I'm saying to the best of my ability, this is what I think that it says. Language at this point, what we call a proto-alphabetic script, can be read right to left, left to right, top to bottom, or bottom to top, or as the ox plows. So it can ramble all over the place. And we know this from other inscriptions from this time period. So there's a lot of different ways that you, you can read this, and I said that from the very beginning, that I expected that there would be alternate readings. The Kerbic Kaiapha Ostrakhan, who many believe is the oldest Hebrew that we have, dating to about the year 1000, after Yossi Garfinkel from Hebrew University published that, since then we have 11 different articles that have been published with 11 different interpretations of it, okay? So remember that where there are two archaeologists, there are three opinions, okay? So this, or as was her name, Ag Agatha Christie was married to a famous archaeologist, uh, excavator did Ur with Leonard Woolley, said that there's blood on the carpet sometimes. So, you know, so, a lot of opinions on these things. This is our view of what it most likely says. You can get a look here at, for example, letter by letter in our Heritage Science article, we go through these, but here is the he. This is the H sound in Hebrew, like the word hallelujah, for example. So you can see a man with his arms raised. Now we know this from the, the Proto-Sinaitic inscriptions down at Sedebet el Chavim, from, from this whole genre, and there's different forms, the seated form, the standing form, and so forth. So, this is what we believe, for example, that we were seeing in the scan is this character, which is a known proto-alphabetic character. Now let me explain what I mean by proto-alphabetic. We have modern Hebrew, we have Paleo-Hebrew, which is Biblical Hebrew, and then we have the predecessor of that, which is a proto-alphabetic, up to this point people have called this proto Canaanite or Proto-Sinaitic literature. Nobody wants to stick their neck out and say that it's Proto-Hebrew, but the Bible indicates that Moses and Joshua wrote. In fact, it tells us God told them to write and he told them to read to the people. This indicates literacy and it indicates an alphabetic form. Now, either that's true or it's not. Now, we've had several generations of scholars who have been trained in a system of thought that this could not possibly have been the case. It's called the documentary hypothesis or, or thesis. And the idea is that the, the text is composed with a J source, an E source, a D source, and a P source, and they're hundreds of years apart, and it's only redacted by, say, the Persian period or the Hellenistic period. So, in other words, Moses and Joshua did not actually write. Now, if you're a Christian, you might want to start with the fact that Jesus said Moses wrote the Pentateuch. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a starting point. But, but these people say no. Uh, that's, Jesus may have thought that he did, but he couldn't have possibly done it. That's literally what they teach these people in seminaries. Like, I've got a, a friend who went to Princeton Seminary, and that's literally what they, they taught him, that it could not possibly have been the case. So this is a big, big deal. Were they literate? Were they not literate? Was there an alphabet with which they could have written? Because Middle Egyptian has like 700 characters in it. And if Moses is going, I assume Moses was fluent in Middle Egyptian also, but if he was going to write the Pentateuch in Middle Egyptian, this would have taken a library to compose it. With a phonetic alphabet, then it becomes very possible. I'll give you an analogy. Um, my master's is from UT uh, in English. Uh, so I know a little bit about the development of the English language. You have 
what we would call Old English. Think of, say, Cademan's hymn, a Christian hymn, 5th century, 6th century. It's the oldest example of English that we have. You can listen to it online. You won't even recognize very many of the words. We have Middle English, say Chaucer's English, the, the Canterbury Tales. You'll recognize most of that. Then we have Modern English, and then we have Texan, a, a, a clearly more advanced version of the language, okay? You have the exact same thing with Hebrew, okay? You, you have an old, original Hebrew that I'm calling proto-alphabetic. It's where the, the Egyptian hieroglyphs are first transitioning into phonetic letters. And that's what we are seeing here in this script. In other words, it's the oldest lettering that we could possibly have. I was in shock. I was blown away by what we were seeing. Now, you have to understand, I'm not an epigrapher. I'm an archaeologist. An epigrapher is an expert in ancient handwriting. So I have three epigraphers on this team. And all three published, well-known epigraphers are all three telling me the same thing. They are seeing these letters within here on these scans. So, I mean, I'm seeing the scans too, but I'm not an ex that is not my primary field of expertise. I'm relying upon them, and this is what they're telling me that they're seeing. In the end, this is what we believe the transliteration was. It was a chiasm. It actually had a literary form. And this would be our interpretation of this. You are cursed by the god Yahu, the three-letter spelling of the divine name of Israel's god. And that's really the key, because the Canaanites and the Israelites use the same alphabet. What makes it Hebrew and not Canaanite would be if there is a word that is uniquely Hebrew within it. And so if we're right that you have the name Yahweh or Yahu here, um, then indeed it is a, a proto-Hebrew inscription, and it would be the oldest by about 500 years. The oldest mention of the name of God, I should say, by about 500 years, and the oldest inscription by 200 to 400 uh, years, oldest Hebrew inscription. And if that's the case, then there was an alphabet with which Moses and Joshua could have written. And when, num when you read number six, the priestly blessing, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord be gracious to you, may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And when you do this, he said, you will put my name on the people. You'll put my name on them. How do you put the name of God on people? So, I mean, we haven't even known what the name of God looked like to Moses and Joshua because there's alphabetic development and now I think we do for the first time. You're cursed by the God, Yahu. This three-letter spelling is the same. A mistake that was made in this, this IEJ article that was a response uh, a few days ago, they said that the uh, oldest reference to the, the name of God comes from, what did they say, the, the Moabite stone or something like this. No, it's actually from Egypt. The Solib hieroglyph in Egypt, and this is a fact, okay? You can just search it for yourself, Solib hieroglyph. Uh, that is from the reign of Amenhotep III. It dates to about 1366, mid-14th century B.C., and it has the name Yahweh. You know what it says? The land of the Shasu, which are nomads, of Yahu, yor the three-letter spelling of the name of God. So that's, again, the oldest form that you might expect. For those of you who are Bible readers, you might think about Job 19.24. Job, many of us would believe, is the, probably the oldest book in the canon, Job says, oh, that my words were written on a lead tablet with an iron pen. You see how that's a very ancient way of thinking, writing on lead and then sealing it makes it binding. So if I'm right, or if we're correct by this, you have a summation of the curses of Deuteronomy 27 and 28, and they're then placed on the altar there where they're ultimately then going to be sprinkled with blood when the sacrifices take place. So the, the blood covers, covers the curse. Um, it's not what I was expecting to find, but I, I felt like I had a responsibility to report what we found and what I think that it says to the best of my ability, and then everybody can hash this out over time and, and you know, see where we land uh, with it. This is what the name actually looks like. The divine name, notice the he in the middle, the, the man with his arms raised in worship to God. Integral to the nature of God is the concept of worship, and that mankind himself is actually integral to, to God. We also found blades, rounded blades of the type. 
mentioned in the Mishnah that are used in the sacrificial system. We found other flints, pottery that Zertal had missed that ended up in the dump pile. These, these dots like this are only found at highland sites in Israel, for example, Shiloh, where I'm now excavating in Mount Ebal. And Israel Finkelstein, one thing I would agree with him on, believes that these are indications of tithing. And I, I think that probably that is the case. You have awls. Uh, we also have styluses, which we did not publish in the article for lack of space, but I will publish eventually. And then my conclusions were that Zertal was correct in his identification that this was a biblical altar. Um, I believe that the early date of the Exodus is plausible or the biblical date. At least some of the early Israelites were literate. I believe that the documentary hypothesis is problematic. And I believe that wet sifting and tomographic scanning are important technologies for avant-garde archaeological excavations. And here are some links that you may want to access, my article in particular. And then I will end with the same quote with which I began. Back to Professor Steger, if there's an altar on Mount Ebal, as Zertal claims, we biblical scholars and archaeologists should all go back to kindergarten. Class is now in session. Amen. Thank you for listening today. Thank you very much. That was uh, very educational, Thank very you. enlightening. So, uh, in just a few moments, we will move to the Q&A. Uh, Reminder of our rules in the Q&A. First rule is, please ask a question. So sometimes you get that one person that'll go on and on and on and on and on, and then there's no question. They just wanted us to know what they thought about the topic. Hmm. So don't be that guy, okay? So please, if you need to set up your question with a little bit of commentary, that's understandable. Uh, please try and keep it brief so that other people have an opportunity to answer the question. Second rule in the Q&A is that I'm the president, I always get to ask the first question. So, instead of me asking a first question, can I sit right here? So, as you mentioned, in the Israel Exploration Journal, there were three studies that were published in the last week, and these three studies are very critical of your interpretation of this particular find. So what I'd like to do is to uh, talk about each one of those studies, and uh, I'll have some comments and some questions and give you a chance to respond okay. to those. So, just for the record, you knew that I was going to ask you about this. You have no idea what I'm going to say or what I'm going to ask. So I want to look at the first study. The first study is by Professor Matsar. Uh, Professor Matsar is a retired archaeologist in Israel. He's a very highly respected uh, archaeologist. Uh, he said that the object has been misidentified. Uh, he says that it's not a cursed tablet but it's actually a fishnet sinker, a weight for a fishnet, okay? So I had two comments in, our, in regard to this, and I was hoping that you could uh, comment on those. So in, in his study, there was a, a figure. It was a set of renditions, artistic renditions. It had 14 items that were drawn, and uh, the first one was the Mount Ebal object, and then there were 13 versions of sinkers. And if you, if you, for me as a layperson, if you, uh, if you play the game, what one item is not like the others? To me, the Mount Ebal object is clearly not like the others because each of the others are bent around an object. So each one of them has a circular impression where it was folded around a, a rope or a net, and it's very visible in the side view whereas the Mount Ebal object is completely flat. So, so that to me was odd, uh, that, they, that he would use that as, uh, as an example of a fishnet. And then the, the second thing was that, I'm, as, as your map showed, Mount Ebal is well inland, hmm. and it's equidistant from the Mediterranean coast and the Jordan River, approximately. Uh, and it's up on a mountain, right? Mount Ebal is mm -hmm. up on a mountain. And so as I was reading it, I was wondering, well, what is a fish net sinker doing at the top of Mount Ebal, well inland from the coast? And so to Professor Matsara's credit, in his summation, uh, he says, of course, 
One has to ask how and why a fishnet sinker made of lead from Greece found its way to the inland mountain site of Mount Ebal, where almost no other imported objects except a few Egyptian scarabs and two small Mycenaean shirts were found. This question remains to be answered. So if you can comment on that study. Thank you. Um, I really like Ami Mazar, and I admire Ami Mazar, and he is a, a friend of mine, sent me an email when, he, when the article was, was coming out and so forth. Uh, he's the, uh, the nephew of Benjamin Mazar, the, the famous Benjamin Mazar, the cousin of Alat Mazar, who's excavated what's likely David's palace in Jerusalem. So I think the world of, of him and his, his work. Um, there are some problems with it, and uh, I say this with great respect and deference to him. Uh, you pointed out one or two of them, but let me give you the numbers from his own article. And, and these are easily accessible. I, did, I, I think I sent them to you, and you could share them with everyone else if, if you want. But um, he cites, there's a whole typology for these fishing weights. And there's what are called L2.3 is one categorization of fishing weights. Now, I grew up in a fishing village, but I've learned more about fishing weights recently than I could have ever imagined. So L2.3. And within that, it subdivides into A and B. So in Israel itself, ancient Canaan, if you will, the Levant, southern Levant, he cites in his article that there are 333 type L2.3 sinkers. 331 of which are type A, two of which are type B. He believes that the Mount Ebal sinker is type B. The two that, supposed two that have been found from, come from a coastal site, Tel El Ajul, near Gaza, right on, the, right on the coast, that Petri excavated about 100 years ago. They come from a tomb. And the drawings, I looked at them again this morning, um, look, don't even look like what they would call the type B. In fact, in tombs, you don't find fishing weights in tombs. Guess what you find in tombs? Defixiones, curse tablets. That's what you find in tombs. And I would suggest those two should be restudied, uh, if we can find them, who knows where they are after 100 years, that those should be studied for possible inscriptions as well. If they are fishing weights, then they're very, very different. Uh, even in the larger Eastern Mediterranean, it's only about 1% of the L23s that are supposedly these type Bs. And so my sense, oh, and there's even a discrepancy. They cite Galilee and, and others in their, in their study. That's where they get the typology. And the, the sinkers, that the information he's saying that they said, I went back to their source and they didn't say it. So now I need to go back to Petri, back to the original source, and check that again. So, you know, a good bit of work to, to be done uh, on this. But that's my, my number one contention is it's not logical that you would have this at an inland site inside of an altar. And guess what body of water is close by? The Sea of Galilee. Do we have any fishing waves? We've got lots of fishing waves that have been excavated at sites around the Sea of Galilee. Guess how many are type L2.3? zero. And so that's my response to Professor Mazar. I think as Shakespeare said, me thinks thou protestest too much. Okay, thank you for that. The second study uh, was by uh, Aaron Mayer, I believe, mm -hmm. and then Christopher Rolston. And uh, I'm familiar with Christopher Rolston. I own one of his books. I've read numerous uh, papers of his. He was a very respected uh, picture uh, I'll tell you, as a lay person, uh, this study I thought was uh, much more compelling and I think uh, requires a response. So three things that came up in the study that uh, uh, I'll comment on and then let you address each of those. So the first one is, has been a common complaint that I have read in many news articles, and that is that when you have the photo and then the artistic rendition beside it, that a lot of people can't see in the photo what is drawn in the artistic rendition. People are complaining they don't see the letters that are claimed to be there. So that's, that's the first uh, issue. Should I comment one at a time? I may not remember the, by the time we get through three, I may not remember one, so I'll just try to be succinct. 
Um, I agree and I sympathize. Believe me, it took us a long time to be able to see these in the actual scans. And so we're at the disadvantage of putting these into 2D images when we've been looking at 3D scans. And so I agree, they're not as clear as we would like. And all I'm saying is that nonetheless, I have a responsibility to publish what I think we found. And this is what I think it says, but I am sympathetic to that criticism. Yeah. Okay. And, and as we get better, my, my partner in this, Peter Vanderveen, um, has had cancer and is just recovering from it to the point that I think we can follow up on this, but we'd like to get up a website where we'll have more scans, more video that scholars can see. Okay. So, yeah. uh, the second point, and in your presentation you mentioned that from previous texts, we know that uh, the proto-alphabetic was left to right, it was right to left, it was a, the ox plows where it goes back and forth, you find it vertically, uh, but the interpretation here is what they refer to as a, a letter salad sort of a shotgun approach, not following any specific uh, lineage, if you will. Uh, and they were not aware of any text, I believe, that had that sort of approach. So if you can comment on that. Yeah, it's, it's problematic. You have, I wish I could show you others. For example, Sinai 375A or Sinai 363. They're all over the place. And I think these ancient people aren't, writing in the sense that they're wanting you to read it. So it's just simply in the fact of me writing it, it now has power. So it's, it's binding and it has power once it is written. They're writing on a very small surface with a very fine point and my own handwriting is horrific, okay? It's gotten worse the older that I get. Since I stopped writing years ago, it's even worse. But um, you know, sometimes I have trouble reading my own, reading my own writing. So, it is, uh, I agree, there is no predictable pattern uh, to this. Um, that's why I said at the outset that we expected there to be many different interpretations of this. All I'm saying is to the best of our ability, having studied it, we think this is most likely what it says. I agree that it's what we would call boustrophodone, it's moving about. And I would only just add that ours isn't the only proto-alphabetic script that does that. All the proto-alphabetic scripts, uh, the one that's most recently published just a few months ago, the Lachish uh, Lysecomb. So you have a Lysecomb from ancient Lachish that's late Bronze Age too, and it has an inscription on it. It's the same way. So it moves from top to bottom and so forth. So. Okay. Uh, the third point was uh, a little bit above my head, but I understood the uh, criticism, I believe. So they refer to the Matris lexionis mm. and uh, the Mater lexionis, uh, which they believe that you included in your uh, interpretation of the text. And uh, they said that if that is true, then they call it, quote, an egregious anachronism. They were saying that those mm. two only existed much, much later than when you would propose that the text was written. Yeah, the, one is singular and one is plural. So matris or matris, lexion. It's, it's the use of uh, consonants as vowels, like in English, Y sometimes could function as a, as a vowel, for example. Um, in our article, we give numerous examples of where they do, and we cite them in there. R instead of responding to the examples that we gave, they just said, it cannot be because we say it cannot be. And um, along with the scarabs, they don't respond to Dafti bin Tor, along with the pottery. They don't respond to, I mean, you disagree with me, but I am a ceramicist. I mean, so I think you've got to take me on point by point, not just say it's not so because I say it's not so. And on this, we give our citations, we give our parallels, and it deserved a response. Now, I also respect Aaron Mayer. I also respect Chris Rolston. I invited Chris Rolston to be a part of this collaboration. I sent him two emails, this is three years ago or whatever, asking him to be a part. So obviously I res respect him. He did not respond to either one of my uh, emails. So I would have loved to have had his input along the way, but uh, he was too busy or, you know, I, which I can understand, probably has a lot on his plate. Um, but that's what I would respond. Um, you can't, two things that happen in this article. Number one, there's the straw man argument and in logic, and apologetics, you would appreciate this. A straw man argument is saying that I said something I didn't say. They said there were very clear scans, okay? 
And no, I never said there were very clear scans, okay? I always said that they were challenging and problematic, okay? And so there's several things that they're saying, the, the source of the lead, which we'll get to in a minute. They say that that proves that. I never said that. I was very careful not to say that. So by making it sound like someone is saying something outrageous, which I never said. The second is that it is so because I say it is so. Now, when I was publishing something a few years ago, my editor came back to me and said, Scott, just because you say it is so does not make it so, okay? So in other words, I know you think you're right, but you have to document this. And there's several claims like this. So to just say it can't be so, the mater lexionis, because they say it can't be so, deal with what we put in the article because we have examples of it and citations and parallels. That's what I would expect to be refuted in a scholarly um, response like this. But you're a journalist now, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mentioned three that actually I just brought up a fourth, and that was uh, they had uh, criticized the methodology in that your first paper was based on the interior of hmm. the object from the uh, tomography scans. He said it might have been better to put the first paper was based on the exterior where perhaps those letters were more clearly visible and easier to see. Um, you might comment on why? Yeah, I agree. Uh, looking back, I wish that we had published the outside before the inside. There is writing on the outside. Um, and I will give you an example. Um, an, an upside down ox head there. Um, if, if that's not a proto-alphabetic uh, aleph, then I don't know what is, okay? So we have clear lettering on the outside, um, and I wish that we would have waited and published, published the outside before the, the uh, inside. And um, that would have been, I agree with their criticism, that that would have been better. Um, we are still planning to do that, but as I said, my co-author is just recovering from cancer. There's a war going on in Israel. You know, I need to get back to the tablet. And so some things are beyond my control, like cancer and wars. But, you know, and then we have multiple publication deadlines that we're juggling. But anyway, we're doing the best that we can. Yeah. That's clear to me. As a, as a lay person, an alien is like an octave, correct? Right. I, I've seen drawings of an alien, and I do recognize that. And just as a lay person. I don't see how you could miss it. Now, look at this one. Notice how that's negative. It's bulging through. These letters that we noted, by the way, there are bulges on the outside that reinforce what we're seeing on the inside. This isn't some crack in the lead. And that's a, a good example right there. That's a bulge through. This is protruding from the outside in. That's protruding from the inside out. OK, the last thing, and uh, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name, mispronouncing the name. Mema Yaholam Mac. Close enough. Is that yeah. close enough? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, is it a she or is it? She. She. Okay. Hopefully, she won't be offended by that. So, my understanding was that she did a completely independent study of the lead to verify if it came from the same Grecian mine that, that you had claimed, and she confirmed that that was the correct mine site. However, she was critical of the dating. And uh, when I read her criticism, it doesn't appear that she's actually addressing your argument in, in the day. So did I pick that up correctly, or what would you say? No, I, again, Nahal Mack is a uh, professor at Hebrew University, great scholar, love her to death. And I'm grateful that she published the, the lead. So we know from a sample we took that the lead came from a mine in Greece, Lavrion, Greece. We know that mine was in use in the late Bronze Age. It was also in use in other time periods as well. Here's the critical point. And Mayer and Rolston pointed out in their article in the Iron Age 1, that's from about the year uh, 1200 to, to 1000, a different source of lead was being used in Israel. It's in Mayer's and Rolston's own article. So in the late Bronze Age, they're getting lead from Lavrion. In Iron Age 1, it's coming from a different source. All I said is that logically, I never said this proves it, I said it suggests the plausibility of a late Bronze Age date. Okay, so we had the, the style of the letters was one thing, we had the archaeological context was another, then we had the plausibility. So if exports from Greece 
to Canaan ceased around the year 1200, which is one of the few things that all archaeologists agree on, or at least slowed to a trickle, to use Aaron Mayer's words, then logically, if the two choices are LB and Iron 1, and it comes from Lavrion, it is plausible, and that is all I ever said. And so for Aaron or anyone else to imply that I said something otherwise, show it to me, because I know I didn't. And it's certainly not in writing. Okay. Yeah. By the way, John, I did read those same articles yesterday, and I would summarize your criticism as being uh, confirmation bias on both sides. People want to see what they want to see. But my question for you as being sort of an engineer scientist, your methodology of going back to these uh, dump sites and using a wet uh, extraction versus the dry, and finding all of these uh, missing artifacts, those seem to be contaminated, potentially, but there are people new to come around the room. How do you prevent contamination? And then the second thing is, the tomography, you're always going to have an interpretation for it. You're slicing three-dimensionally, and then you're pulling that up to two-dimensional. So those, the methodology is new. How do you defend that in your conclusions? Yeah, great question. Um, we cannot control that. Um, we cannot say that nothing happened, that no one added something to a dump. But now, the, these authors agree with me that we're dealing with an artifact that is from late Bronze Age to Iron One. Initially, they were claiming, oh, it's probably, you know, ended up there at another time. So there's limited value that we normally can gain from an old dump pile. My purpose of the project in the first place was not that I want to excavate more dump piles. It was to prove that we've got to do this in situ. We've got to do this in context. Like we are at Shiloh, so we, we know exactly where everything's coming from. So it was a methodological project, but you're correct. On the tomography, you are also correct. This is challenging, it's problematic, it's avant-garde. I tried to be as humble as I could and say that to this is what we think we have seen, and to the best of our ability, this is what we think that it says, but you are correct. Yes? So how many fishing sinkers have riding either on the inside or the outside? So they, how many fishing sinkers have riding? Um, a few have writing on them, like really big Greek letters or um, Islamic, like Arabic script, script letters. There are a few and some of them have striations or a marking. Let's say a maker of lead weights puts a big X or a big circle or something like that, that that's his sort of mark. But as far as writing, I only know of two. Now, anything is possible. I cannot prove that Mazar is wrong. I cannot prove that this is not a, a fishing weight. Um, I'm just saying if it is a fishing weight, it's got proto-alphabetic letters on it. So it's a very old fishing weight, and it seems strange that it ended on Mount Ball. But I cannot prove that he's wrong. Yeah. So two things. One is, would you mind giving us a little bit of an autobiographical sketch of yourself, please? You just mentioned some interesting things. Number one, number two. It seems like the, the significance of this depends upon the claim of the word Yahweh or the symbol for Yahweh on there, right? So is the dis, is, is that disputed? The symbol for Yahweh? And if so, is that where the further scholarly research is headed? Um, yes, Mayer and Rolston are saying there might be letters on there, but we can't see them. The scans are fuzzy to us. We can't see them. Therefore, we're not accepting that there's anything on there. Others are saying, well, there is writing, but we have no idea what it means. Um, and so, yes, without, if there is no, no Yahoo on there, then there's no proof that it's proto-alphabetic Hebrew. All we could say then is that there is writing on a lead object at a biblical site at a time and a place where the Bible says that the Israelites wrote and where there was an altar. So, um, and as far as autobiographical, I think everybody can, for the sake of time, there's a bunch of hands up. Maybe well, everybody can find me online probably. Yeah. yeah. Somebody else is controlling the questions, not me, so don't get mad at me. My question is... I got enough people mad at me already. As significant as these inscriptions must have been to the engraver, why would they do it on such a small surface? You know, if this was their significant writing, why in the world would they do that on a larger slate? 
Yeah, good question. I don't know the answer. We do have defixiones of this size. They're usually small. Uh, and listen, we have hundreds of these throughout Israel. They're normally found in wells. Oh, and here's, here's a good one for you. There's a well at Caesarea Maritima, which is on the coast. And when Barbara Brunel excavated this, at the bottom of it, she found maybe, gosh, I don't want over 60 curse tablets or some because people would throw them into wells, into tombs and places into the earth, you know, where they're going to have an effect in the spiritual world. And guess what? Guess what her critics immediately told her? These aren't curse tablets. They are fishing weights. And of course, on the coast, you know, you say, well, okay, they maybe maybe they're right. But now they have proven that, they're, that there is writing on them and that there are curses on them. So they are small typically, and why, I don't know. Yes? Uh, I'm imagining this tablet is a folded piece of lead. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Uh, first question, why is there a reluctance to open this up? Would it be mm. more visible to see the inscription if it were opened up? That's such a great question. Thank you for asking that. Yes, we tried to open it, and that's when this corner broke. So in our lab in Jerusalem, with my conservationist, who's the best, very, very carefully, under very controlled conditions, I tried to put a small amount of pressure to see if this lead was pliable at all, and when, when we did, that corner broke. That was the corner that I used for the scientific testing of the lead. Okay, um, and so of course we stopped at that point and I was not going to go any, any further at, at that point. That's why we did tomographic scanning. Uh, also, uh, can you tell how close these two surfaces that are folded together are to one another? I mean, is it possible that in a, a surface adjacent to a letter is affecting the letter? Like a letter? Oh yeah. That's right. That's part of the challenge is, yeah, where does one slice end and the other begin? And, you know, we spent 18 months working with this to the best of our ability to understand it, but that is a problem. Right, one other thing. Um, is there, what is it that affects the uh, detail in the inscription? For instance, oxidation or if this was found and maybe compressed with other material perhaps that would yeah, fortunately, lead is, doesn't really you know, decompose. I mean, so here we have it over 3,000 years ago, maybe as much as 3,400 years ago, and it doesn't decompose. Well, just let me point out one more thing here. On the fold uh, of this, this tablet right here, so if it were opened up, it would be like this. So that's solid there. Here's the, the, the cut. On all of these fishing sinkers, 100% of the fishing weights, those published by Mazar and anyone else, there is a bulge here where a rope went through at one point, okay? And this is a tiny percentage. It's an illogical way to make a fishing weight anyway. So 99.9% .9 of them are not that way. They have holes through them and you run the, the, the rope through there. But if we're to understand this typology correctly, they have grooves where a rope was once there that is now biodegraded, this does not, and Mazar admits that that's a problem in his article, he says that it must have been compressed at some, some future point, or the other possibility is that it never had the groove. So, sorry, David, I didn't know how interesting this was going to be, um, if it said curse tablets, I was like, do we want to go to that one? <laughs> yeah. So I want to do the two question thing, sorry about that. But the first question is, how many fishing weights, I mean, our fishing, a modern fishing weight is, is cast, you know, molded. So are these old ancient ones made of folded sheets then? Is that the technology? For the most part, yes. Yeah, for the most part, yes. They're folded sheets. For the most part. Oh, that does make it count. Second thing is, my computing is so strong that I just put a 3D picture on Facebook and just by moving the phone around I can do it. Uh, you go to a uh, street level map from Google, you can take a trackball and go all around an intersection and look at every side. Of every so what's side. the question? So when uh, can you load all of your 
Going to John's second question, when can you load all your layers into an app where a person can just use a trackball, go up, down, sideways, look from all angles like you can with, with your drone photo uh, site there? Yeah, we're, I'm hesitant to put a time on it because if we don't meet that time, you know, then I'm going to catch all kinds of flack from that. As I said, the person on my team who's responsible for that, it's recovering from cancer, and uh, we'll do it. It's doable. It's I'm aware that it's doable, yeah. No, I didn't no. know that. Yeah. I'm just guessing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's cool. We'll do it as soon as we can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you saw that the name we got there were three letters. I, I always thought it was four letters. Yeah. Because most you know, they all they said you know the four letters there. Uh, is there any other evidence of a three letter name for God, or maybe got a human name there, or, or what is that? It's a great question. The tetragrammaton we normally think of as four letters, uh, Yorevahe. Um, but I gave you one example of a three-letter spelling. I said it's at the Solib hieroglyph in Egypt, the land of the Shasu of Yahweh or Yahoo. It's a three-letter spelling there. So apparently in the beginning, it's a three-letter spelling is more dominant. Also at, um, at um, a Pithos B at... Um, the, sorry, the name of the site is escaping me. In the Sinai, Kuntilet Ajrud, in the Sinai, um, you have there the wife of Yahweh, is very controversial sort of a text, but that also has a three letter spelling. In the Bible, you have uh, the two and three letter um, appellations as well. Like many names in the Bible have that three letter spelling on the end of them, um, a theophoric element, we would call it, like Netanyahu, for example. Yeah, Yahoo, that's the three letter spelling that's, that's on the end. So yeah, you have the two, you have the three, and then of course you have the four. I would say the three seems to be the older sources are using that. Okay, we'll like this for the last question. Oh. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> Better be good. Um, no, you can't carbon date lead, typically. Um, do we save it after we wet sift it? It's in another pile somewhere, but I mean, after we've now checked it at that point, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what else we could get from it because we've separated bone and, and we do carbon dating on that and all of this stuff. And then your first question was? Um, I think it was that, um, the process. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, let me say this. Um, one or more of these articles said, you know, uh, not many of these have been found or whatever. If we'll start wet sifting, you disagree with me on the, the methodology, on the inscription. I'm, I'm not dogmatic or adamant that I have to be right about any, any of that. Um, but don't disagree with me on the value of wet sifting, okay? because if this would not have been found, were we not wet sifting at a high and so, so none of these sites in Israel have been wet sifted, none of them. And if you start wet sifting them, you may have these all over the place, which will help us understand uh, weight technology better, may help us understand defixiones better as well. And that was my goal of the original project, so. So can you yeah. describe the difference between dry sifting well, after we have dry sifted, okay, two volunteers are shaking a screen and then it's being checked and it's going into a basket where a supervisor will, will look at this and we know where it came from. Then they dump that down a funnel into a chute with a mesh bag, which then goes over to another tray where we have water pressure and then we wash that matrix. And in the washing of that matrix, all the soil comes off all the incrustation comes off, and now you can see, I mean, scarab is that big. And you're looking, as a volunteer, you're looking at thousands of little rocks with, covered with dirt, you know, every day. And so now the, the bula, which is made of clay, can you imagine trying to determine a, how could a volunteer ever find a bula? It's blind luck. The, the two most important bula now in Jerusalem are the Hezekiah and the Isaiah bula. Elat Mazar found both of them about six feet apart. Hezekiah and Isaiah, six feet apart, in that iron two stratum there, 
guess what? She took those, the, those key loci and she subcontracted to have them wet sifted and they were washed. She missed it in dry sifting. Of course she missed it in dry sifting. And had she not done that, we wouldn't know about the Isaiah and the Hezekiah Bula. So my, my cry to my colleagues, and we're building wet sifting stations for other digs now, and some people are catching on to this. Uh, University of Haifa, we've helped them. The Antiquities Authority is sending their team to me for training now and learning how to do this. But I'm just shocked at the pushback I'm getting from established archaeologists, you know, like, oh, we know what we're doing. We're not trying to tell anyone what to do. I'm just saying it's like we have a cure for something and we want you to know about it. Should doctors wash their hands before proceeding? <laughs> yes. And during and after. Dr. Strickland, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you.